better. I've been dealing with recolonization, including aptitudes to recolonization, since I, my graduate student days. I've uh, never dared to touch the Old Testament, and I've overcome my fear, but not my trepidation. Um, within this general context of comparisons and parallels, the issue of uh, the treatment and attitudes toward the act of colonization, appropriation, possession, and settlement is one of paramount importance, and I think it's a common human history uh, that in recent years is putting much more emphasis on the notion of mobility and movement rather than fixity and permanence. Um, we're going to try this comparison, and the main theme that I have chose, chosen to speak about is the notion of foreignness. And if we're also dealing with histoire de mentalité, then the question of attitudes towards being new upon the land is of paramount importance. In the Iliad by Homer, we hear much talk about the heroes bragging of their raiding exploits. Some speak of the time even prior to the Trojan War. Some speak, seem to mention raiding en route to Troy or concurrent with the siege of the city. But nowhere do we find an attempt to justify or legitimate such actions aside from interpersonal reasons such as losing one's cattle or women to some other raiders. In short, raiders do not settle. Raiders don't need don't feel the need to justify the actions of possession of another city because in the final analysis they do not possess it. The, the issue of capturing Troy, the end result would be a return home. Greeks mostly saw themselves as newly arrived, foreigners in the lands they were occupying. As Moshe Weinfeld, Weinfeld notes, this is quite different from the self-images of autochthonous existence that we meet in the ancient Near East. The city of Eridu, for example, existed since, well, the creation of the world. But unlike the Greeks, in the extremely rich corpus of ancient Near Eastern writings, aside from those of the ancient Israelites, there are hardly any stories about collective migrations and foundations. Mm -hmm. Among Greeks, the notion of autochthonous origins is actually quite rare and bound with usually some problematic or debated problematic. Was the idea that the Athenians were autochthonous truly universal? Apparently not. On the other hand, well, an autochthonous model suggests growth, not arrival and foundation. In contrast, every foundation consists by definition of a story about a foreigner, and I emphasize foreigner, coming from elsewhere and an encounter with other narratives that concern the place founders had arrived at. All founders are foreigners. It's almost axiomatic. Sometimes founders were deliberately portrayed as having foreign ethnic origins. Cadmus, for example, the founder of Thebes, was supposedly a Phoenician, according to some versions. Uh, Pelops, the eponymous hero of the Peloponnesus, whose tomb was venerated at Panhellenic Olympia, was a Phrygian. Danaos, perhaps the eponymous of the Danaoi, was supposedly from Egypt. This applies also to Greek notions of non-Greeks. In terms of origines gentium, Greeks could project the foreigners Medea as the ancestress, sorry, of the Medes, Perseus of the Persians, or Odysseus, co-founder of Rome and leader of the migration of the Etruscans. In fact, the most popular framework for collective foundation stories in Greece was that of the newcomer, the immigrant, the conqueror. How foreign were they in relation to the places they had founded? But first we need to ask, what is a place? The place always precedes the founder. There were oceans came to Boeotia some 60 years after the Trojan War, and the Heracleidae, descendants of Heracles uh, of Thebes, led their Dorian army into the Peloponnesus 20 years later. If both Boeotia and Lacedaemon, or more specifically both Thebes and Sparta, were not founded by the, new, uh, the newly arrived, they had been there earlier, some from primordial times. Yet we need to clarify, I think, these categories that connect the notions of foundation to that of a place. First, we can observe the myths about founders of the land, primarily not political founders, Apollo and the nymph Cyrene, Helios and the nymphs or Rhodes, the eponymous of Rhodos, yeah? or Heracles vanquishing Antaeus and opening up Libya for human habitation. To this 
this category belong also genealogies of the land, as I call them, such as like Edamon Sparte Teigitos in Eurotas. Pausanias relates the conventional genealogy according to which the autochthonous ruler Lelex had a grandson named Eurotas who channeled the marshy waters to the sea, thus creating the river Eurotas. His daughter Sparte married like Edamon, the son of the eponymous nymph Teigite. Quote, once in power, he first of all renamed the country and the people Lacedaemonians after himself, and then founded a city and named it after his wife. The city is called Sparta until this very day, says Pausanias. But in this day, the inhabitants of Argos, Sparta, Corinth, and other cities were Dorians, who replaced whoever was there previously. Such genealogies of the land, or culture, myths, such as that of Antaios, explain not specific political foundations and the formation of territories, but rather the emergence of places and how they became free for human habitation. Second, we have those glorious cities that existed in heroic times and ruled by epic figures who are, however, disconnected from the current affairs, as it were, especially in the Peloponnesus, the house of Tyndareus, tenuously linked with the primordial genealogies, was replaced through marriage with the Atreidae, among whose proud descendants we find kings of Argos, Mycenae, and Sparta, Agamemnon, Menelaus, and Orestes. Then there are the explicit Ctises, immigration and foundation myths, that directly link historical societies with their past. This is the third category of foundation, a new polity, a new territory, defined where Perceived with perceived notions of territorial boundaries, in contrast to the open-ended land myths with their springs, mountains, and monsters. The whole point of the Heracleidae Charter myth, as first articulated by Tertius in the 7th century BCE, was the extermination of the previous Atreid line and the refoundation, refoundation of Corinth, Argos, and Sparta as new Dorian cities. They had all been in existence before. What were new were the Dorians and the Heraclete kings and aristocrats, such as the Spartan royal houses or the Corinthian Bactrians. Yet we note unease with the idea of the absolute foreigner, an absolute newcomer. Because unlike the invading Dorians, the Heracleidae, their leaders themselves, were supposedly just returning. Since their ancestor Heracles, himself a Theban and certainly not a Dorian, had acquired the right of possession when he restored Tyndareus to the throne. The notion of the right of return through heroic figures and ancestors provides some legitimacy in stories about immigration and foundation and allows a holding the stick at both ends. The Dorians were new. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve you the Lord. <coughs> Let's go on. והיה כי יביאך יהובה אלוהיך אל הארץ אשר נשבע לאבותיך, לאברהם, ליצחק וליעקב, לתת לך ערים גדולות וטובות אשר לא בנית, ובתים מלאים כל טוב אשר לא מילאת. ובורות חצובים אשר לא חצבת, כרמים וזיתים אשר לא נתת, ואכלת ושבעת. Basically, uh, the same idea. Not bound by any monotheistic exclusiveness, the Dorians found no difficulty in being at once proud of the conquest, claiming the divine right to do so, yet worshipping the gods and heroes of the land. Alternatives could coexist. Through a mythological and cosmic modalities, continuity was established, somehow subsuming earlier local identities in the process. Echoes that this was not always successful are evident from the case of Sicyon, where the tyrant Cleisthenes forbade the performance of the Homeric poems because they extolled pre Dorian Argos. He also renamed the three Dorian tribes of Sicyon, giving them derogatory names while naming his own tribe. Archelaoi, masters of the people. Sikyon exemplifies that the difference between Dorians and non-Dorians was still an important issue in the 6th century. 6th century, sorry. Paradoxically, it also testifies that the contemporary Dorian Argus, Claesonus' enemy, was acknowledged by him as a direct extension of Homeric Argus. Otherwise, why, why go through the fuss? 
the case of continuity could not have had a better advocate. We may perceive more aspects of the mentality of settlement by the newly arrived or the foreigner through the practices of foundation, in contrast to the monotheistic emphasis on difference that sees integration as a threat <coughs> to the cult of Yahweh. Other Hebrew practices of foundation seem similar to Greek ones, as well as seen by Weinfeld, although he sometimes mixes uh, uh, formal aspects with thematic ones and plays with the dates a little too carelessly, I think. These, in and of themselves, imply similar impositions by the foreigners on the ground. I'm claiming here thematic similarity, leaving aside the question of direct possible uh, influence into the texts. In both cultures, the Hebrew and the Greek, the land or country is objectified and perceived as an entity to be divided by lottery. The Hebrew notion of nachala is comparable to the Greek kleos. Already Zeus, Hades, and Poseidon had divided the cosmos through lottery. The Heraclidae similarly split up the entire Peloponnesus. Among them, an individual settlers received their kleoi, both in legendary ktises and in historical colonies, again by means of lottery. Archilochus, for example, tells of a miserable Aethiops who, while he was still on his way, had lost in a gamble his expected kleos in the new settlement. Lycurgus famously, or supposedly, split up the Lacedaemon uh, into uh, 30,000 domains and lots that couldn't be sold or partitioned. Allotment and sortition seem to have been integral to Greek practices of foundation, as we can also see on the ground. For example, at Megara Hiblaya, uh, in the eighth, uh, uh, last quarter of the 8th century in Sicily. The interdiction on sale of the individual Kleros at Sparta is very similar uh, to Leviticus 23, uh, 23. I'd let the biblical scholars interpret Gerim with Toshavim for me. In Joshua 18, we hear of the seven tribes that still await allocation of lands. Joshua sends three men from each tribe to spy the land in order to write or uh, uh, describe it and according to their divisions. The lottery is conducted by the archegetes like figure Joshua, namely leader-founder, as well as the counterpart of the Greek seer, such as Onimastos, the Delphian, who would accompany the founder, think of Batus at Cyrene, and there you have also Elazar, uh, the priest, who is responsible for such allocations. Now Shiloh, so I think you should know this better than I do, was the Israelite oracle that, like Delphi, provided settlement charters with connect, which connected specific groups with specific allotments, thus providing a charter which mediates between the foreigner and the land. The, concept, the content of the question addressed to the oracle is also very similar to the Greek formula, to which land shall I go? Doreos, for example, in Herodotus. In Judges 1, the tribe of Judah is given a specific area, uh, a, a specific area for conquest, uh, although its inquiry is phrased in terms of leadership. And Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. The oracle is similarly consulted to confirm the nomination of Joshua as a military leader and by implication the successor of Moses. And we see this quite similar to the confirmation by the Delphic oracle of prominent founders. And finally, through the Hebrew accounts concerning allotment, we get a glimpse of the role of women 
as foreign participants in the foundation, a problem that a priori must have existed among Greek settlers with regard to the nucleoid, but for which our sources are silent, except by implication with regard to Sparta. These are not native women. Among Greeks, lots guarantee the preservation of the individual oikos, or oikoi in plural, namely households. Hence the celebrated status of the Spartan epikleros, the term is significant, she who is over or about or responsible for the kleros, the nachala, the, the unit of land. The woman who inherits the kleros and thus keeps it intact instead of joining it to her husband's family. It's not for great feminist reasons that they did that, of course, but this is precisely the status which the daughter of Tzlofechad claimed. It was recognized and accepted by the leaders of Israel. In Numbers 36, the elders from the families of Joseph came to Moses with the following complaint and demand. So the claim in the final lines is then their inheritance will be taken away from the inheritance of our fathers and will be added to the inheritance of the tribe whereunto they shall belong. So will it be taken away from the lot of our inheritance. So this is a serious matter how inadvertently colonization gives a rise to the status of women in a situation of foundation and conquest while emphasizing the fact that they are not native women. There's a big, those of you who know, there's a big controversy about the role of women in recolonization, as if they must have been natives or not. And finally, it's also the voice of the women themselves, not of the elders. And the end of the discussion becomes general in the rule, not just specifically to the daughter of Tzlotichad. And here's the, uh, the women speaking. It's their voice. Rare do we find such women's voice in the Bible. Lame ikarashem igarashem avinu mitoch mishpachto ki ein lo ben tna lanu achuza betoch achei avinu. And it ends with a final general rule that Bnei Israel tedaber lemor ish ki amut uven ein lo vavartem et nachalato levito. Saying if a man dies and have no son, then he shall cause his inheritance to pass unto his daughter. So to reach the conclusion, the idea of foundation expresses an event, punctuating time, rather than a process. Recalling in the historical period perceived in terms of actions done during the lifetime of the founder, solemnly sealed with heroic ritual at the time of his death, then burial in the Agora. Let's get a bit of that and an annual cult. Okay, so the foundation is an event sealed with the death of the founder. The founder is always a foreigner arriving from elsewhere, another place, rather than another ethnic group. The founder, whether mythical or historical, represents the beginning and the focus of collective identity. Autochthony is a rare self-image. Immigration and settlement rather form the more common notion of one's belonging and collective identity implying also the inherent foreignness of most foreignness of most ktises and the aspects of mediation and integration with a pre-existing place. With a pre-existing place and its alternative foundation myths. The foundation of new polities usually belong only to the third stratum of foundation origins myth. They are preceded by myths of the land and those of heroic time expressly disconnected from the later political foundations which are foreign in their aspect of migration, conquest, and settlement. Sometimes a disconnection with the heroic past is deliberately compensated through rituals of mythic notions portraying the connection with the land as some return. Polyphasia made it easier to connect to local gods and heroes. In contrast, because of religious reasons, the foreignness of the Israelite colonists emphasizes difference rather than sameness. Aside from that, the thematic powers or practices of settlement and appropriation are noteworthy. Both Hebrews and Dorians took over existing cities which they had not built and rich lands 
which they had not labored, both received similar foundation oracles, both used seers and priests, distributed entire countries and individual plots of land by means of lottery, and both needed to consider the legal status of women accordingly. Foundation and foreignness are thus major components of collective identity, the self-awareness of being collectively young in a new old land. Thank you, Yorad. The next uh, lecture is by the co-organizer of this conference, Alexander von Talkin, who will be speaking about comparable chronologies, the context of 